Hey guys, it's Kathy. So welcome to my live stream this week. So hopefully, um, just hoping to help students out there who are either taking a break from school with the whole pandemic going on or are doing their classes electronically. So just trying to be there for you and support you and answer your questions. So thanks so much for joining me. So a lot of you submitted questions ahead of time and I've prepared some responses for some of that. Also just try to um, take some questions on the fly here too, if I can't. I've got uh, Angelina, who's part of our team. So she'll be on the chat as well. And she'll try to bring it to my attention if I'm missing any key questions or things that you guys want to um, hear about. I also need to offer a disclaimer that my kids are home. I have um, two teenagers at home with the whole quarantine thing. So if there's some background noise or whatever, you'll, you'll have to forgive me. Okay. So um, yeah, I know a lot of you, I'm seeing here that um, some people don't have any clinicals going on right now. Um, I know a lot of you either have online classes or maybe your school's taking a break or maybe classes are delayed. Um, so I know it's frustrating when you've got this plan and this goal to become a nurse to have these kind of changes and delays. So I totally feel for you. One of the questions I got beforehand is, um, is I would recommend choosing your study space wisely. For some people, that means um, studying at home. Um, and if we were in a normal environment right now, I might suggest studying at the library or at a coffee shop, but those are not options right now. So really, you just have to kind of choose wisely um, within your home in terms of what is a good study spot. So um, things that I would not recommend are like laying down in your bed and studying, right? That can get a little, um, sound like a good way to want to take a nap um, and to get distracted. Um, if sitting down, if you're still finding yourself getting drowsy and not being able to focus, maybe try listening to your lectures or doing your work standing up at the counter. You might want to use some like noise hand, uh, canceling headphones if that's helpful to kind of block out um, some of the sounds around you so that you can stay focused. Uh, that's a good idea. Also taking breaks and um, maybe doing a little bit of exercise or jump rope or whatever to try to get the blood flowing and get some energy back um, in between online lectures that may be helpful for you as well. So uh, those are some of my suggestions. I would also suggest that after um, an online lecture that you go back and take some practice exams if possible on the material that you just learned to help that information really solidify in your head. So I have found that to be really, really helpful. All right, let me look at comments here. Um, I have a college and high school student at home and my husband, same. I have all of those people at home. <laughs> and um, two out of the three are not really excited about being home. So my son is huge into figure skating. The skate rink's closed. My daughter is home from college and she's used to having a very independent lifestyle and doing her thing. So she's not happy to be in the home. So I feel you. Um, good. So Danny's been watching my videos this week. I'm so glad. I hope they're helpful for you. Um, Oh my gosh, homeschooling. Yeah, people with little ones. I mean, having teenagers at home is one thing. Having little ones at home, that's a whole other bag. So I really feel for you if that's the case. Um, yeah, and DZ says um, they usually study at school in a quiet room. I know. A lot of my go-tos for how to stay focused, you can't do. Like I used to love to go study at a library. Um, some people I know like to go to a coffee shop. And again, those aren't options. So you really just have to make the best of the situation at home. Try standing up while studying. Try doing some exercise in between. If you, um, depending on where you live, if you've got a porch or somewhere outside that you can try studying, you can try that as well if it's not too distracting. Um, let's see. I sometimes YouTube coffee shop background noise. Excellent. So <laughs> try to transport yourself there to the coffee shop. Um Let's see, how many practice questions would you suggest to do and how often should we practice? Every day, every other day, et cetera. 
really as much as you can. If you have time every day to do practice questions, um, there's really not too many that you can do. That being said, I don't want you to just kind of go through like 100 practice exam questions really, really fast, right? You want to take these practice exams slow. And every time you answer a question, you want to very kick about that and try to absorb that information, okay? Because a lot of those, um, those rationales and explanations will contain key concepts that are really important for you to know to do well on your exams. So do enough practice exams that you can really thoroughly study that information. Again, don't just fly through them. For questions you get wrong, I would recommend going back and reading the applicable section in your textbook to kind of get better informed on that subject matter. So next time you get a question, you'll be better prepared, okay? Um, let's see, the NCLEX study guides help me the most. Um, have to develop critical thinking. Let's see, my program starts in June. So excited. How can I prepare for my mental health um, nursing class? So um, I know some of you said that your, um, you, you know, your program has been delayed or you're going to be starting a little later than planned. And how can you make the most of your time? Uh, so for those of you who are getting ready to start nursing school, I know I've had some questions about uh, pre, from pre-nursing students as well. How can I prevent um, trying to get ahead and learn some key concepts? Our health assessment deck that's available on our website, levelupRN.com, is really great. And it will give you a really good feel for how to do a head-to-toe comprehensive patient assessment get you used to um, understanding and remembering like normal ranges of findings, what is expected versus unexpected. It's really a good way to kind of um, get geared up for nursing school. In addition, pharmacology. So I started learning drugs well before I started nursing school because I was terrified about pharm pharmacology. So my, um, I guess my skills, I'm, I'm pretty good at critical thinking, but memorization is not my jam. So it takes me a lot of repetition to memorize drug names, um, as well as, you know, key side effects, etc. So if you're like me, and memorization's not um, your, you know, strong suit, then I would definitely um, work on learning drugs ahead of time. So we do have a pharmacology uh, deck that can help for that as well, as well as videos that go, um, that you can use alongside of that deck to help learn the medications. Um, if you are in nursing school and your upcoming class, maybe if it's pediatrics, my advice is do not ever underestimate how much work pediatrics is. It's kind of like a whole med surge again. It's just a lot of information. And I don't know, sometimes people just don't appreciate how much time it's going to take to learn that information. So if PEDS is in your near future, then definitely get a head start on that. Learning the material, going through your book, maybe doing some practice exams. Okay. Mental health. Mental health is also quite a bit of work. And one of the challenges with mental health is all of used for what condition know what the key side effects are, etc. So I do have videos um, for a lot of those medications in addition in my pharmacology um, uh, stack, my um, study deck, my flashcard deck, I'm trying to get that word out. <laughs> um, those, uh, those drugs are covered in that deck. Okay, let's see. I've studied all of your cards and now our med search to um, protected and canceled and the instructor is writing her own exam to and doing it at home. I'm worried. Yeah. So I know a lot of people, um, there's a lot of different ways that schools are handling exams. Um, some people are taking exams under special like circumstances where there is like video and audio, audio monitoring. Um, I know that NCLEX um, is offering for a limited amount of people to come in and test at a time so that we can maintain social distancing. And also they're offering the NCLEX with like fewer questions so they can accommodate more students. And that's actually one of the um, questions I got here. Is it a good idea to take the NCLEX with the new changes or is it harder? So I'm not an expert on this, but my um, perception is that 
there may be a little more with less questions. Um, there's a little less leeway to um, to to get them more right. So what I'm what I mean by that is normally with NCLEX, you're you're answering questions. If you're doing a good job, the questions will get a little harder. Um, and if you start doing bad, the questions will start getting a little easier. And really, they're just trying to gauge your understanding of the core material. And if you demonstrate that you really have this understanding at 75 questions, it will shut off there. If it's if you're just kind of on the bubble and you need to demonstrate that you have that understanding, it may go past that. And with the traditional NCLEX, that can go well above 200 questions. So with this new NCLEX that maxes out at 130, you're just going to need to demonstrate your proficiency earlier and a little faster. You're not going to be able to go on to 200 plus questions to try to meet that threshold. So the most interesting concepts. So our cards and our videos are really designed to help you learn those key concepts. So our resources definitely help. But in addition, practice exams are super important. And um, I personally used UWorld after graduation. I used it for about two months. I probably could have used it for less time, but I was like paranoid. And so I used uh, I used UWorld. I find that UWorld offers really good rationales and explanations um, that really helped me to understand the material. The questions are hard, right? They're fairly hard questions. So when you get kind of not the greatest scores on these practice exams, try not to freak out um, because you're like, oh my God, I got a 70. That's actually not too bad in the U world um, space. Again, the key thing is that when you're doing these questions, that you're reading everything and really learning um, from those questions. So, I I do recommend U world. I had um, I felt like it was a really positive experience, and it really set me up to do well on the NCLEX. Okay, let's see. Um, where can we find NCLEX practice questions? So um, there's a variety of places that you can find NCLEX practice questions. But um, like I said, UWorld's my favorite. I have used Kaplan as well. Um, and of course, in my nursing program, I used um, ATI. But like I said, UWorld kind of stands above the rest for me. Let's look for passing the NCLEX. So I'm sure that feels amazing. You should be so proud of yourself because I'm super proud of you. So great job, um, Rosalinda. Okay, my exams are going to be on Blackboard. Let's see, um, how can I remember signs and symptoms for different diseases or does remembering them come with experience as a nurse? Well, you kind of have to know those signs and symptoms as a nursing student too, um, as well as as a nurse. So my really important to know what the key functions are of that body system and that will let you know that when something goes wrong with that body system, it'll kind of lead you to what signs and symptoms you can expect. For example, let's talk about your kidneys or the renal system. One of the key functions of the kidneys or the renal system is to maintain fluid balance, acid-base balance, and electrolyte balances, right? So your kidneys will excrete fluid as needed, retain fluid as needed. It will excrete or um, reabsorb electrolytes as needed. So that's one of the key functions of the, the kidneys maintain fluid electrolyte levels and acid-base balance. Then if the kidneys get messed up, if we have kidney failure, then we can expect things to go wrong with the fluid balance, right? We're going to have a backup of fluid because our kidneys aren't doing their job of excreting excess fluid. So we're going to have like fluid overload. We're going to have electrolyte imbalances, including hyperkalemia possibly, which is you know, pretty dangerous and can cause life threatening dysrhythmias. So we know we're going to have electrolyte imbalances and we are also possibly going to have um, acid base imbalances. So some of the side effects um, you can kind of back into from knowing the key functions of a particular body system. So that's kind of like using your critical thinking versus memorizing like the functions of a body system and then memorizing the signs and symptoms. If you can Okay. Our school recommends UWorld. Yes, I recommend UWorld too as well. It's a little pricey, but it is a really good program. 
Um, let's see, got his UWorld. Oh, my professor got his UWorld for free. Well, lucky you. That's amazing. Um, can I, how to make, you don't want to just put down like everything on your flashcards, right? You don't want to have your flashcards be overloaded. You have to really um, pick out what the key information is, what the key concepts are, and really try to isolate that, those things on your flashcards. So um, when I was in nursing school, I used flashcards. I made flashcards. I probably had a stack of flashcards this big when I was in nursing school. Um, now that I do flashcards after, you know, since I've graduated and I've been working as a nurse, a lot of my nursing experience and knowledge goes into making those flashcards. So I have a better idea of what's most important to include on those flashcards versus as a student, um, I did pretty good, but in general, it was hard to know sometimes what was most important. Okay, let's see. Um, best way to answer short answer questions for community health nursing. Um, well, I don't know that I have a great answer for that other than you just really need to know some of those key concepts so that you can answer the questions. Um, what else do we have there? Uh, Daniel, sure, there you are. You're well, well I needed. A 70, I got a 52, any pointers to focus on? Okay, so well, med surge is obviously a lot of material. I, and this is from Nakia. I don't know, Nakia, if you have used our videos and flashcards, but those can really help you to focus on key concepts you need to know from um, medical surgical nursing. And because there's so much information, it's hard to know where to focus your attention. So we can totally help with that. In addition, I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but um, practice exams are also um, super important. Okay, let's see, um, how to practice lab values. Like how long should I study them? My mind is not absorbing them. Okay, lab my frustrations in nursing school was that I felt like lab values were kind of scattered all over the various books. So if I wanted to look up a specific lab value or study, the lab values all at one time, I would have to kind of flip through the book and find those different lab values. So I do have a nursing lab lab values flashcard deck, which I wish I had in nursing school. And really it just contains all the important lab values in one deck. It'll no, not only give you just. So uh, one of the questions I got um, ahead of time was talking about heparin and coumadin and PTT and PTINR levels. So I will be, um, I thought I would cover some of those specific questions towards the end of this uh, live video stream. Uh, so if you submitted that question, hang in there, I will be covering that. And I will say that those lab values are all covered in this deck um, with an explanation about what's normal and what's not. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, we can change, upload more. Yeah, I have more videos on their way. And okay, happy always. Awesome. Um, I'll be purchasing lab value soon. I think you'll really like it. I really like having all my lab values in one place with those explanations because, um, and with the silly hints. Again, I'm all about the weirdo silly hints. Uh, and I'm glad you like the pharmacology deck. Okay. All right. Let's go back to some of these questions I got ahead of time. Um, Let's see, what should I study now that my start date for nursing school got delayed? I, I did talk about that a bit. So like I said, health assessment's a really good place to start. Pharmacology, start learning those drugs now. Medical terminology is another thing you might want to brush up on um, before nursing school starts. Okay, let's talk about, um, we did talk about preparing for the NCLEX. We talked a little bit about UWorld. We talked about doing practice exams and reading those rationales and explanations very carefully. Um, someone sent me a question here. Please cover what new graduate nurses should say to their employer about their preceptorship or capstone being canceled. So we are so scared to be hired with such a meaningful learning experience being taken away from us. We don't feel prepared for the real world, but need jobs. So I feel you, you know, having your preceptorship or your capstone canceled, that is, you know, um, I feel like employers and hospitals are going to understand the current environment and why you couldn't have that experience. And hopefully they'll go the extra mile to help you get that experience. So 
if you're able to find a job where at a hospital system where they have a new grad program where they provide like extensive preceptorship as well as classes, then that is ideal. Now I know at my hospital system, our new grad program was 40 weeks long, about 13 weeks of that was with a preceptor, but there was classes and education along the way within those 40 weeks. So it was a really good program. So since you haven't had that capstone, you know, internship experience in your nursing program, it's going to be really important if you can find a job where they invest pretty heavily in new grad nurses and offer a lot of um, preceptorship as well as classes for you to learn. Okay. Um, also, let me say this, if you, again, beggars can't be choosers sometimes, right? Sometimes it's pretty competitive to get a job out there. But if you have a choice, starting on a unit that is more specialized can be a little easier as a new grad. So if you start on a unit that is really focused on neuro or a, a unit that's focused on ortho, just one area and it's kind of specialized, it's actually kind of easier for you to kind of spin up as a nurse and to get your flow and to learn everything versus if you're thrown into a floor, like a med surge tele floor where you get like a little of everything, it can be overwhelming in the beginning. And that's the type of floor I did my new grad job on. And it, it was a lot. You're kind of like a jack of all trades. Over time, you learn a lot. That's great experience. But in the beginning as a new grad, it's pretty overwhelming. So if you're feeling insecure and your geographic area allows you to like kind of pick what position you want, I would, you know, uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to go to like a more specialized unit to kind of ease your way into nursing. Okay. And then that being said, also, I just want all of you new grads out there, people who are going to start your new job as a new RN to just be aware that it's, it's a tough, it's a tough hill. There's a lot to learn. Despite everything you've learned in nursing school, there's so much more to learn and you need to give yourself a lot of grace and a lot of patience and you're going to come home a lot of nights and feel like I could have done better. I didn't do everything I needed to do. Um, it could be frustrating and you just have to be patient. It will come with time. Um, and you just need to surround yourself as you know best possible with people who are supportive. Find those supportive nurses on your floor. Ask lots of questions. Ask for advice. And with experience, you'll you'll get that confidence. Okay. All right. Let me go back to questions here and see if I see anything. Um, do, do, do. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, someone wrote in that they're taking the NCLEX on 429, but no PPE makes me frightened. And the idea of doing things outside my scope of practice only on PPE, but I know there's a shortage. They are starting to kind of ration things at my hospital and I am frightened for what is to come regarding PPE. During my last live session, I think I um, vented a little bit about my frustration um, regarding the shortage of PP, um, I don't see any of them over there wearing bandanas. Um, so I feel like as you know, the U S we're like one of the richest countries in the world. We, we should be able to solve this. We should be able to get our PPE and protect our healthcare workers. So, um, I could talk the whole time about this, but there is, um, there is a petition going around from the ANA, American uh, Nurses Association, regarding PPE. We need to be making uh, PPE requirements based on science, and we need to make sure our healthcare, healthcare workers are protected with PPE. So I hear you on that. Outside your scope of practice, if you want to protect your license, okay? And if you have an employer that is asking you to work outside your scope of practice and to do things that are going to endanger your license, then you need to find another employer because you work so hard for that license, right? All of you students out there, you, you work your butt off for years to get that license. So don't do anything to jeopardize that license. You know, make sure your documentation, your charting is complete. And if your employer is asking you to do something outside your scope of practice, you should refuse and explain that is outside your scope of practice. A good employer will not ask you to do that. And I 
you don't want to do that. So don't risk that license that you work so hard for. Again, you need to operate within your scope of practice and you don't want to be doing things that are outside your scope of practice. So you can definitely learn from our materials, but just keep your scope of practice in mind. And then you'll be really well positioned to go to a um, practical nurse to RN bridge program at some point. So if you learn from our resources, you'll be well positioned um, to do well in a bridge program. Okay. Pediatric milestones and immunizations was another question I got. So I did want to tell you that there is a uh, pediatric nursing video playlist. And that information regarding milestones and immunizations is towards the beginning of that playlist. So definitely just go to that playlist and um, you can get all that information um, in the first like handful of videos. Someone else had questions about fluid and electrolytes. So fluid and electrolyte balances is covered in cards 90 through 98 in my med surge deck. Um, and also you can find that information also covered in my med surge playlist around video 33 is where that information starts. And then someone else asked about um, chronic kidney disease as well as acute kidney disease. So that information is in cards 133 through 137 in the med surge deck and also on video 48 in my med surge playlist. And then one other person asked about lupus, which is covered in cards 213 through 214 in the med surge deck. So I know those questions were submitted ahead of time. So I just wanted to make sure you knew where to find that information um, to you know read up if it's in the cards and also on the videos. Okay, let's see what else we um, got here. Please give us hints on HESI, I'm so scared. Don't be scared. So honestly, um, once you learn those key nursing concepts, which I'm here to help you do, um, you will do fine on whatever testing platform your program uses. So whether that's ATI, HESI, Kaplan, it doesn't matter. And then ultimately the NCLEX. They all ask questions a little differently. So in addition to learning the key concepts, definitely do some practice questions on the HESI website. Pretty sure they have practice questions as well because you want to get used to how they um, like to ask questions, okay? So um, don't be scared. Stay focused. Um, and like I said, our, our materials here can help you. Um, do you have YouTube videos for maternity? I do. So um, I do have a maternal newborn playlist, so you can check that out. And any tips on how to remember neuro disorders? Well, there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of different disorders. So it really just takes repetition. So if you have our med surge uh, deck, um, well, there goes that deck. <laughs> Um, or at least that was part two. Oh, hey, I still have part one here that I didn't dump on the floor. Um, it kind of goes through all the different um, disorders and some of the key points regarding what the disorder is, what signs and symptoms you will see when someone has a disorder, and then how we treat that disorder with medications and what is the nursing care um, that is provided for someone with that disorder. So the cards can help as, you know, as do the videos. And like I said, it just takes repetition. So try to carve out your time if you can. Try not to do these like marathon study sessions where you're studying for like 10, 12 hours and do that over multiple days. You'll learn a lot better. The stuff will sink in a lot better. Also, if you're still able to go for a walk and wherever you live, um, you know, I'm sensitive to the fact that some of you may be like in New York City or somewhere where they may not want you out kind of walking the streets. But if you're like in a neighborhood or area where you can um, walk while, you know, still practicing social distancing, take the cards with you and go through them repeatedly. And for me, when I exercise and review my cards at the same time, I learn a lot better. For some reason, that information just sinks in a lot better for me. Okay. Let's see, um, can you show us one of the cards to see what the content looks like? Sure, let me show you. Um, actually, you know what? I was getting ready to talk about um, PT, PTT, INR. So I can kind of, this is on my um, lab values deck. So here's like the front. 
of an APTT card. And then on the back, it will show you what the expected range is, what the therapeutic range is on heparin. And when you have increased time, what that means and what is the antidote for heparin. So that um, that just gives you a feel that for that card. And again, PT, slightly different information here, but same type of thing. So those are some examples of the nursing values flashcards. I'm gonna try not to dump my cards again. I got a big mess. Um, all right, let's see. I can give you another example here. Um, so for example, like when we're talking about seizures, when we're talking about neurological disorders, um, this is a card that focuses on types of seizures. So we've got like tonic-clonic, absent seizures, myoclonic, atonic, and then what is um, status epilepticus, okay? So it gives you a feel. I do, if you go to my website, I did make like a little video for each of the decks to, and I hold up some of the cards so you can get a feel. Um, for what that particular deck um, looks and feels like. So definitely check that out for more information. Okay, um, this semester and so happy I could be part of your journey. That makes me really happy. Okay, um, Jay Lewis, you're in New York City in the house, LOL. We can go outside, but limited, no gathering. Yeah, so I figured that if you're in New York City, like walking around may be a problem, but if you can, you know, if you can find a way to, if you have access to a treadmill or anything, I just, the exercising and looking at cards, doing those two things at one time, it's really effective. It has been really effective for me. And I know for a lot of other people. Okay. Should we talk about some specifics guys? Um, do you guys want to talk about Coumadin and Warfarin and PT, PTT and INR? Are you ready to go deep on a little bit of content? Um, I know some people um, asked about that. And honestly, blood thinners, these anticoagulants, really important to know, really important to know for nursing school and as a nurse. So, okay, let's talk about it then. So it's really important to understand for what medication are we monitoring PTT and what medication are we monitoring PTINR? So for heparin, which you can administer to the patient via IV or IM, we are monitoring PTT. So the H in heparin, it kind of looks like two T's put together to make that H. And that's kind of my little hint for remembering that PTT goes with heparin. And then with Coumadin, which um, the brand name for that, are, I'm sorry, Coumadin is the brand name for warfarin, we're gonna be monitoring PTINR. So heparin offers very fast anticoagulation. So when a patient is in the hospital and they need fast anticoagulation, we're gonna put them on heparin right away. And we're gonna monitor those PTT levels to get them to a therapeutic level. When we are thinking about discharging the patient, we're gonna be starting them on warfarin or Coumadin and that takes a number of days for that to reach therapeutic INR levels. So sometimes patients are going to be on these two medications concurrently. They're going to be on heparin right away because that offers that fast anticoagulation. And then we're going to, while they're in the hospital, also start them on warfarin to get those levels up. And then we'll discharge them with just the warfarin. Okay. We're not going to be giving them uh, heparin outside of the hospital. So Let's talk about heparin. So again, the way I told you to remember it is it looks like two T's put together. So you remember we're uh, monitoring PTT. Expected PTT range is between 30 and 40 seconds. Okay, that's what it is normally. When we have a patient on heparin, the therapeutic range for PTT will be 1.5 to two times that amount. So we're looking at roughly 45 to 80 seconds. Okay. So when we want to thin a person's blood, we put them on heparin, we expect their PTT to get a little longer, somewhere in the range of 45 to 80 seconds. If they have a PTT that's much higher than that, like over a hundred, that is a problem. We are thinning the blood too much and they are at risk for bleeding. 
So it's important to know what the antidote is for heparin. And you guys, anybody want to answer that there? I don't know how much of a delay is here, but someone tell me what the antidote for heparin is, because you got to know it. It's super important. Bueller, Bueller. All right. I think there's a little delay. Probably when I tell you the answer, it's all going to start roaring in. At least I hope so. So protamine, um, it's protamine. So it's not like now talk about Coumadin. So with Coumadin and Warfarin, we are monitoring PTINR levels, not PTT. So the expected PT range is between 11 and 13 seconds, roughly. And the expected INR range when you're not on any anticoagulants is between 0 0.8 and 1.1. So it's right around one. When you have a patient on Coumadin, we want their PT range to be 1.5 to two times higher. So we would expect their range to be between 17 and 26 seconds. Okay. And then their INR a therapeutic INR while they're on Coumadin is between two and three. So we want to adjust the dose till we get them, get their INR between two and three. And if they end up having too high of an INR or their PT range is much, or their PT level is much higher than the 26 seconds, then what is the antidote guys? What do we give someone for, um, as the antidote for warfarin? So we had protamine for heparin. What is the antidote for warfarin? Vitamin K. Excellent. So you guys got that. So you'll definitely probably get questions about uh, questions about PT, INR, or PTT with one of your nursing exams or um, and or on the NCLEX. So you definitely need to be um, prepared with that information. Okay, so that was some, uh, I think I covered most of the stuff that people sent ahead of time. Um, so I'll just, um, I'll take comments now, take comments and questions, and we'll see where we go. And then if there's not much else, then we'll wrap it up for today here soon. And then I'll do another live session next week if you guys like. So thank you for everything, getting us through nursing school. Super happy that I could do that. I just, yeah, I love um, helping people learn the information. Um, I love being able to try to take some often complicated information and try to boil it down to some key points. So I'm glad it's been helpful for you. Um, when you'll do mental health. We will definitely be um, covering a lot more material. I'll be doing more videos in the future info. I do. I actually have a whole EK, EKG interpretation deck, which I didn't put on my desk. It's like over there, but as well as videos that go along with that, a complete playlist. So I know for me, when I was in nursing school and I learned EKGs, I kind of just memorized a bunch of things about rhythms without truly understanding why they looked the way they did and understanding really the concepts behind that. So in my deck and in my videos, I really try to explain that and simplify it and help you understand why rhythms look the way they do and what are the key attributes of each dysrhythmia. So definitely check out that YouTube um, video series as well as the deck on our website, leveluprn.com. Okay, um, can you explain how a ventilator works? So mechanical ventilation um, is gonna be an important concept for uh, critical care nursing. I would definitely um, be aware of high pressure alarms versus low pressure alarms. What conditions would cause a high pressure alarm versus what conditions would cause a low pressure alarm? That's um, gonna be important. I do cover that information in um, my med surge uh, deck. So definitely check that out. Um, I have a neuro exam on Monday. What should I focus on more? There is, yeah, neuro is huge. There's so much information there. Um, so I would definitely be aware of seizures. I would definitely um, fo uh, focus on migraine headaches. I would definitely know about spinal cord injury as well as head injury. I would know about MS. Um, I would know about myasthenia gravis. I would know about that as well. 
trying to remember what else I'm trying to remember. Um, I talked about seizures. Let's see what else I have here. I have my deck here. So I'll tell you what else I would know about some of the diagnostic procedures, such as a cerebral angiogram, MRI, EEG. I would remember those. Lumbar puncture, how you know if they have a bacterial infection as opposed to a viral infection. When you take a lumbar puncture, I would know that. Um, I, uh, we talked about meningitis, so meningitis, seizures, oh, Parkinson's, as well as Alzheimer's disease. I would be familiar with those. We said MFM. So just find out if you're going to be tested on those things, such as like glaucoma, cataracts, macular degeneration. Um, Meniere's disease, that type of thing. So if the sensory system is included with your nervous system, then definitely know those things as well. So um, those are some topics. I know it's a lot. Let's see. Um, I would love it if, I, if you can give a quick bit of advice for my first med, sur med surge exam on oxygenation and um, perfusion. So um, I would be familiar with um, the signs of hypoxemia. And I would be familiar with the different um, types of oxygen therapy and like what liter um, oxygen liter per minute flow you can use for each of those. And when you would use different ones, I would know the signs of oxygen toxicity as well. Let's see, what else would I know about for respiratory and perfusion? Um, Find out if you need to know about ABGs and uh, chest tubes is a really important one to know as well. And like I said, with mechanical ventilation, I would definitely know about low pressure and high pressure alarms and pneumonia is going to be important as well as asthma and COPD as far as conditions. So um, remember, asthma is kind of intermittent and reversible as opposed to COPD, which is like chronic and not reversible. So really understand the differences between those diseases. Okay. Um, I don't have autoimmune uh, videos yet, um, but they, I will definitely have autoimmune um, topics that I cover in future videos. Let's see. Yes. Sensory is on the exam. Um, thanks. Back at back at the books after the session. Yes, I know it. I know it's a lot. So again, when you're going through that information, really, what is that disease? Like what causes that disease? What are the key signs and symptoms of that disease? How do we treat it with medications and or procedures or surgeries? And then what is the nursing care? What are the key things you need to do to keep that patient safe and to help them get better? Okay, can you explain hemodynamic monitoring? Sure. So hemodynamic monitoring is typically done in the ICU when we're really needing to keep a close eye on all of um, the pressures. So when we need to look at the um, PAWP or the central venous pressure. So for um, pressure in the heart due to the heart failure. So hemodynamic monitoring is typically done in the ICU some of the big conditions that cause issues with that are, are heart failure for sure. Um, let's see, have a study for nursing exam. I struggle when even reading the whole chapter. Yeah, I hear you. So some of these nursing books are like, what, this big? Um, so you kind of have to get good at kind of picking out the key information and then skipping over a lot of the really um, detailed nuances. So a lot of books will like put some of the key concepts in these boxes. They'll like highlight like most important points to know. Um, definitely pay attention to those. And again, through the use of practice exams, when you start seeing the same type of thing show up over and over again, then that should be really a uh, kind of a warning bell for you that, oh, I, I think I really need to know this because I've been asked about this particular concept multiple times. That's a key sign that you really have to know for a new grad to get a job in the ICU. So um, yeah, the, the competition is brutal here in Southern California, and it may be also brutal in other parts of the country, but I know in Southern California, it's rough. So if you can get a position um, while you're in nursing school, 
then and can manage that with your time, then I would definitely recommend that because it helps you get your foot in the door when they are choosing who to hire for new grad positions. A lot of hospitals turn to internal candidates first, and sometimes they don't even hire anybody externally. They will only hire people who are internal candidates, um, employees at their, you know, at their hospital or company. So I did that when I was in nursing school. I worked as a transporter at my hospital, which definitely got my foot in the door and landed me a good new grad position at my hospital. Um, I will be honest that it was, you know, it, it was hard. It was kind of brutal. I was in an accelerated bachelor's program, two kids and a part-time transport job. It was a lot. Um, but, you know, in the end, fast forward, everything has worked out great. I'm in uh, my dream job now as a wound nurse. But um, in Southern California, it's it's brutal as far as competition. So get your foot in the door if you can. Um, if you, as far as you in different um, hospital systems or geography, so it is possible um, at some hospital systems. However, that being said, I think it's it could be helpful to work on a med surge floor before venturing into ICU. But if you can get a job straight into ICU, that's great too. Um, so it is possible. Okay, let's see which ward is good to start for a new grad. Well, like I shared earlier, um, you know, a lot of new grads will start on the med surge floor. And um, that offers a lot of really good broad experience for new grads. If you are feeling a little safe floor that is more specialized, such as a neuro floor, just for neuro patients or just an ortho floor, I feel like that's a really great way to ease into nursing, right? If you're feeling really confident and comfortable, you've been working in the hospital, maybe as a CNA and you're like ready to go, then yeah, med surge telly is a great place to go. Um, but if you're a little nervous, a little new to healthcare, new to nursing, I feel like a dedicated floor is a great way to kind of ease into things and not be so overwhelmed in the beginning. Um, let's see. Wow, I didn't know your specialty is wound nursing. What is the best route or requirements for a graduate LPN to become a wound nurse? So there's a couple different paths um, for wound nursing. As an LVN, um, you can get your WCC, so um, wound care certification. It's kind of pricey. Um, if you're a BSN, um, like an RN, then you can get your WOCN certification. So I got my wound certification at Emory University. I had my bachelor's, so that's why I was able to do that route. It's actually um, the WOCN certification is a little more prestigious and more sought after. Um, but again, you do need your bachelor's program for that. So as an LVN, a WCC is definitely um, a great option as well. So wound care is needed more than ever. Um, we have an aging population, um, so they have more pressure injuries. We have more diabetics than ever. So we have wounds associated with diabetes, uh, in addition to surgical wounds, just, there's, so, there's so many wounds. <laughs> we stay very, very busy. Um, and so it gives you like maximum flexibility. We don't work night shift. So if you don't like night shift, then being a wound nurse is a great way to go because typically wound nurses don't work nights. At a lot of hospital systems, wound nurses don't work weekends as well. So they just work day shifts. Um, I work part-time as a wound nurse. So I work every Monday and Wednesday at my hospital. And I love it. And one day, if I want to go to a wound care clinic, I can. Or I go work for a surgeon's office. There's a lot of different ways to, to play that. And wound nurses are totally in demand. So definitely look into that WCC certification or a WOCN certification. Uh, Emory University is great for the WOCN um, path. Okay, let's see. I'm reviewing for my board right now. And with the NCSBN changing their way of testing now due to COVID-19, my weak point is psych, which will your site help me out with those videos? Yes. So um, I do have a lot of videos in my mental health um, playlist, mental health nursing, and then on my um, in my pharmacology playlist, as well as in my death, I do cover psych meds and psych meds are really important to know. Um, and there's a lot of them and there's side effects and things you got to remember. So definitely spend some time looking at those meds and our site can definitely help with those things. Okay, um, I work as a PCT on an ortho floor, just started and love it. 
So yeah, I have um, my friend who I interviewed for one of these live sessions. Um, her name's Geneva at my hospital. She started on ortho floor as a new grad and it was a really great experience. So she's on a med surge tele floor now, but easing into things by going on an ortho floor where you're working with the same doctors and the same types of conditions kind of over and over again, lets you just kind of get your feet wet and kind of ramp up slowly, get your process down as a nurse and just start to feel really comfortable before you start taking care of patients with like a wide variety of illnesses or conditions. Okay. Um, any advice for going into Neph? But I, I have talked with several um, dialysis nurses when they've come into the hospital to care for my patients and they really like their job. They like, um, kind of going around to the different hospitals and, and doing dialysis on patients. So definitely look into that. The best thing about nursing, and I'm going to close on this because we're almost to an hour here. The best thing about nursing is there's just so many different paths. So when you get out of school, a lot of you will start on a med surge um, floor. And some of you may not like that very much. Um, and there is a statistic out there, I think I've seen where I think it's like 40% of new grad nurses abandon nursing within the first year of being out of school. And it just kind of blew my mind, right? You go to all this expense and effort to get this degree and you go out and it's not what you expected and you abandon the profession. So I urge you to not do that, but instead find a path um, that is better suited for what you want to do. I did med surge tele for nine months as a new grad and I did well, but I'm kind of a perfectionist. That's my personality. So being kind of spread so thin on the floor was not really, um, it's not where my passion lies. And it just didn't sit well with me. I always felt like I was running and never doing enough for my patients. So as a wound nurse, I can see one patient at a time, do very detailed work, move on to the next patient. We're busy, but it's one patient at a time and I feel a little more in control of my environment. So once, <laughs> this was like the first day on, on my um, in my wound nursing position, I was like, yeah, I'm never going back to the floor. I, I, you know, I just love my wound nursing position. So nothing's wrong with the floor, obviously. It just wasn't for me. If it's not for you, just know that there's many paths. You can go to the OR. You could become a certified diabetic educator. You can go into dialysis nursing. You could be a wound nurse. You could be a case manager and never like touch a patient again, right? Case managers are so important in the healthcare system and at the hospital. So, and if, if you're a nurse that doesn't really want to, you know, clean up poop or get, you know, get your hands on, that's a really important role in the hospital. So just know that there's a lot of paths. So before you just abandon the profession, look into navigating your career into an area that is of more interest to you. Okay. So thank you so much, guys. I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody's questions. I was trying to read and answer some as I could go. Um, I'm going to do this again next week. I'm just going to keep doing these live sessions uh, weekly as much as I can um, to help you guys. So uh, when you see the post about uh, next week's session, just be sure to submit your questions and I will um, work on kind of researching those and answering those ahead of time. And then I'll answer them live for you. So thanks so much for all your help and support and everything. And um, we'll see you soon. Okay. Take care.